Jerry, we want to welcome you back to St. Peter's, and we continue to gladly partner with you in your ministry with love for the least. We are happy to have you back with us, especially in this time of um, uh, a season of generosity for us at St. Peter's. In these uncertain times, uh, we know there is a constant in our lives, and that is that we are to continue to love the Lord and love our neighbors. So uh, to get us started, I wanted to ask you what that means for you. What does it mean for you, Jerry Kramer, to love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind? I think for me, it's to <clears throat> see my central purpose in life um, as an agent for the kingdom of God. And that's what my life's about. And everything is secondary. And, um, you know, I think it's hard, certainly impossible for me to always stay in that place. Um, you know, I start getting my agenda working in there and my kingdom, uh, but then getting recalibrated and getting back on that. And then, you know, when you get in that sweet spot and focus, that, that your focus is really God's purposes. Um, what is God doing here and joining him in that and being about God's agenda? Yes. which is healing and redeeming the world and everything in it. And I've seen the kingdom come upon people, upon whole areas of countries. Um, and when you see that, it's just uh, that transformation. Um, it's just an incredible, beautiful thing. So I'm hungry for it. And that spills over into love for your neighbor. And it's a, that's why it's a, it's a discipline. It takes work. Discipline. You, know, you, have to, you have to talk to your heart like David. Jerry, you have served parishes in the United States, and now uh, you serve in a different context for ministry as a foreign missionary. So I am curious how you would describe the differences in those two contexts for ministry. How is it different to love your neighbor in parish ministry in the United States? How is that different from loving your neighbor as a foreign missionary? And how are the two similar? I think communities um, and, and people groups have love languages just like people yeah. do. So like in a marriage, we talk about love languages. You got to learn. And so, you know, when I was rector of a parish in New Orleans, that's a very distinct people group. Um, <laughs> and it, and uh, it, it really takes sort of, um, and they really love New Orleans and being New Orleanians and all the things that make New Orleans up and the things they do there. And you kind of have to throw yourself in there and speak their language um, and become part of that to love well. You know, with the, uh, the Kurds in Northern Iraq, um, they are the, the most hyper-social, interpersonal people I have met on the planet. I've never seen anything like it. And, and really, the, I tell people that you can have bars of gold in your car and they will not be interested in them until they get to know you. I mean, it's, it's really a lot of our life over there is drinking tea and coffee, huh? either in tents or in Kurds' homes, and they really want to get to know us and, um, you know, then build a friendship, and then we can go from there. Mm -hmm. I, can't be, I can't be too busy, you know, to miss that because that's how they want to be loved. Mm -hmm. They love Americans, and they're so loyal, but... Um, you have to put the time in with them. And so it's very different for working in an American culture where it's about results and process and planning and uh, getting things done. So I was rector of a church in New Orleans during Katrina. I was only installed as rector of a 163-year-old church like three weeks before Katrina hit. A huge lesson learned in Katrina is to, is to be very, in a crisis are particularly are very fluid, they're dynamic. And then people recover at different rates. So you've got moving pieces and the needs change. You know, we went through, at the beginning, people were sending us clothes and we had no place to put clothes. Or they were sending us food and we had nowhere to cook anything. It's not what we needed then. Yes. So you're, you're constantly evolving. And so, you know, we got really, really good at relief. And then one day we saw that wasn't the need anymore and we had to move on to rebuilding, pivot. When, when COVID hit, the greatest single need was food. Um, one, the UN's reporting 1.6 billion people right now can't afford food because of the economic lockdown from COVID. 
6,000 children are dying every day from lack of food and meds because of the lockdown. And so since February, really, we just quickly pivoted and became a food relief operation because there's just no point in doing anything else yes. if people are hungry yes. you know, and starving. So we, we, we just made that, that quick shift, and now we're kind of getting back on track again with recovery things, kind of in an in-between place right now. But it's just always assessing the needs of the community and being flexible enough to address those needs. Jerry, where have you seen Jesus in this pandemic? Uh, certainly in the um, response from people in the U.S. Folks have been um, really generous to providing food relief mm -hmm. uh, in East Africa and the Middle East. And just to see the reactions from the people on that end has just been, you know, just praising God and they are so grateful um and and just to see their their gratitude mm -hmm. you know and their response you know and praying for us here sending their love back to us here when have you seen or experienced generosity as an act of loving god and or loving your neighbor oh heck i see it every day all throughout the day and for the last 20 years doing this i just uh, one ex just one kind of cute story that comes to mind was um uh Eid was coming up, which is the big Muslim holiday. And it's more cultural than it is really religious. It's the end of Ramadan. And it's a really big deal. It's like Christmas for three days in a row. And they kind of stretch it out to five. And so we have a quarter million Syrian Kurdish Muslim refugees 15 minutes from our house. And, um, and I just, I mean, it, it really is, it's kind of in a way even bigger than Christmas. I mean, you just can't bypass it. And again, it goes on for about a week. And they just eat and women dress up and it's, it's the highlight of their year. And uh, we realized that the refugees are just trying to survive and they had no way to celebrate Eid. And uh, so we came hmm. up with the idea we were gonna bring them Eid food baskets so they could celebrate. And I'll, I'll never forget, we're walking into the hall and camp and they're all sitting there and it was a little bit tense because I could just kind of feel like them sitting there going, do they not get this is a Muslim holiday? Like this isn't the Christmas distribution. <laughs> I don't think they, I mean, you could just feel it. It was tense. Like they don't understand this. And then it was all of a sudden the light bulb went on and they got that we Christians from America came 8,000 miles and we're bringing food baskets so they could celebrate their holiday that they enjoy so much. And, you know, when the, 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 the switch flipped and they started, they got up and like, you can have a riot there really quickly. And they got up and they're like praising God. And there's like, you know, God bless you. Mm. God bless your donors back in the U.S. We love you. We love the U.S. Um, you know, thank you so much. Because they saw that was just a, it was a pure act of love. There was nothing in it, in it for right. us, right? Um, right. Uh, we weren't trying to sell them or get them to do anything. It was just, have a great holiday and God bless you. And, and that it clearly, it really bonded us. It drew us closer. Mm -hmm. Like these people really care about us. This is a difficult question for all of us. How has the pandemic helped us to know and resist the idols in our life? I mean, that's a spot on excellent um unpleasant question <laughs> um and i'm not a i'm not a calvinist john calvin fan but he did i think he was very much right when he said the human heart is an idol making factory yes <clears throat> we're going to worship something yeah. it's 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 not <laughs> are we going to worship we are going to we're built to worship so it's just are we going to worship god or something else? that's what it boils down to. so i'd say for me with covid i think two things um, one was just the looking at the ministry. Um, I mean, we live downstream financially from churches. So, you know, we see if the churches are in lockdown and struggling, I mean, we're, we're further down the food chain <laughs> from mm -hmm. that. So, um, you know, that was concerning. So it was a worry, but what I had to do is just get back into that place of God started this work. This is God's work, not our work. Mm -hmm. And God's will, God's bill, you know, he'll take care of it. Trust. You know, just trust him that trust. And, you know, we just, we haven't missed a beat. 
you know, but that human nature side, that little unredeemed part, yes. uh, <laughs> resists that, you know, when you're just looking at a balance sheet and wondering how are we going to, you know, I'm looking at what we owe every month to keep it moving. And um, so it put me into a place where I can't do anything about this. There's nothing I can do about COVID and what's happening out there and just coming hmm. empty handed, you know, and trusting God to solve it. He's a really audacious God. Uh -huh. You know, he, he is he is far more outlandish and outrageous and audacious than we even imagine. And, um, you know, I have theology degrees and, uh, you know, and and it all boils down to I've just learned that God's really, really smart and God's really, really good. And and I think the other one piece of it even more personally was, um, you know, my identity. You know, I'm an overseas field mission. That's my identity. That's what I've done for 20 years. And um, this is the longest we've been in the U.S. in 20 years, continuously. We've been locked, trapped in the U.S. since last July, basically. And, um, and to be put in this place where I'm not doing that right now, and that's not my true, true identity. You know, it's what I do, but my identity is, is as a follower of Jesus. And so kind of parking that shell over here, the thing that I do, and being here in Central Texas as a follower of Jesus and, and, and kind of stripping all that stuff away and, again, being a lot more empty-handed is just, you know, okay, I'm in New Braunfels indefinitely or in the U.S. and not doing the overseas field work that I love um, and kind of built a life around. It's, I'm here, God, use me here now. And that's, you know, that's not easy. Yes. You know, sort of identity questions are tough. I mean, it goes to, the, you know, your security and uh, how you feel about the world and to kind of lose that mm -hmm. and be stripped away of that um, and parked in a different place where it's just you and God. Yes. You know, but I've always found that my biggest growth opportunities have come when, um, where I just had nobody else to trust but God. And I was done trusting myself, which is the heart of the gospel. But that the heart of, of the gospel is just coming empty handed and it's sheer grace and it's sheer mercy. And um, I'm kind of hard headed. Sometimes God has to kind of put me in time out and put me in a place where I'm just going to be radically dependent on him yeah. and stop paddling so hard. Yeah. You know, and I think that's been part of it. I, you know, I was paddling real hard at the beginning of COVID. And, you know, and a lot of my pastoral advice to people is to stop trying so hard. So it's really been this journey of, of really letting go and just trusting him and letting him figure this out. And my job is just to watch for what he's doing and do it.